Good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning today. And uh, to uh, join together in worship. We appreciate uh, seeing you all. We have, uh, I don't know, there's some people getting over some sickness here uh, lately. And uh, so I want to pray that uh, it will get well and such. So, anyway, note uh, there are a couple of, uh, well, the announcements we have. Uh, we're waiting uh, one week on our. February fellowship meal. It would be it would be this coming Wednesday, but I think with the uh, wedding happening next uh, weekend and some of the uh, work that the ladies are going to be uh, engaged in for that, we're going to uh, wait a week. That'll be uh, helpful uh, to, to folks. So on the fifteenth, that's when we'll have our our uh, uh, February the day after uh, Valentine's Day. Sometimes we. Uh, Take note of all the sweethearts and uh, some of that. Uh, February 15th at 6 o'clock. Uh, today, if you will, uh, we ask the members to stick around. We're going to have our, our annual uh, meeting and uh, would uh, ask that you uh, stick around for that and have, have a pleasure presentation to cover a couple things. Uh, one of the things we're going to surprise you with is let you know of the, of the uh, decision to. Uh, uh, replace the roof. And at least uh, initially, we were starting with the education building this swing back here. But as the given away, we pulled up and saw some of the some of the supplies sitting out there that made a lot of progress and should make more progress this week. And um, so we'll, we'll update you on that. But uh, um, pray for the people doing the work and the safety of the workers. They, uh, we, we had a group praying Friday morning. I told them, I said, uh, oh, I see a hooded person out there. I forgot. Chip said they're going to start to change the roof. So we had to pray extra loud uh, because they got busy really quickly. Uh, uh, not that uh, we needed to, or to hear us anyway, but it was uh, they they got got in, got here, and got busy on a couple of Friday mornings. But uh, uh, small groups are meeting, and also just keep notice. We we keep announcing this. It's still a little bit away, but if you think you want to share something, you need to commit to it and get on the list. And it's uh, so March twenty fifth. We'll kind of get together on uh, a Saturday evening, uh, late afternoon, uh, enjoy showing some, uh, demonstrating some things and talent, uh, sharing some things that way, as well as maybe have some refreshment. I think, um, I think as uh, we talked some earlier this week, we decided why don't we allow people to have, you know, do their own. It'll reduce some of the stress if we don't try to have a full meal, just have some refreshments. Um, that would tag along with it. So March 25th, uh, plan to do that. Uh, if you can, um, I know that um, we might even be able to do a few things before we actually convene for the meeting. I think it would be helpful. The slides would appreciate any work getting the furniture, table, people put the chairs out. We sometimes take chairs to the nursery. People put it in the table and either go into the office or people can fit in the hallway kind of against the wall and tend to be on the way. So if anybody with strong arms want to help with that, that'd be, I know that would be uh, helpful. We also need to get this these steps down in front. And by the way, they're a lot heavier than they look. Um, so having a few people could be help, helpful to uh, get on either end. Just drop it down there. And by the way, it'll drop real easy. Uh, if we just want to control that drop. Uh, no, so... Uh, I think I see a few uh, visitors, and we appreciate you joining us today. Welcome. Um, and uh, if you see one of those blue cards and one of those slots, we would love if you if we would, uh, uh, leave the information, tell us who you are. I look forward to, to meeting you before some of you may have already met. Uh, I think I'm seeing both sides uh, here, so it, it's nice. We love uh, a place like this. We love seeing new faces and having people join us for worship, and we trust the Lord will. Let's take just a second. Uh, oh, one prayer concern. I mean, we've got a number of things. Sent the prayer list now. Um, Steve is grateful. His eye is doing better since the surgery, so keep praying for him to see that. Um, Buddy Bowers is at Renaissance, Tower, uh, Renaissance Terrace. Continue to pray for him and, and Kay, as well as some of the other things that are listed here. We'll see if you any updates, if there's any that come up here that we can take just a second.
Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Our catechism says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Uh, it is a great privilege we have uh, to gather as God's people. It's not that our glorifying him gives him glory or, or, or imparts glory. It is to make it known. It makes it known to one another. It makes it known to the world. We are to reflect that glory, to make it known. And as those who have been redeemed in Christ, it's a wonderful privilege, a way of saying uh, thank you and uh, to bless the name of the Lord who has blessed us in Christ. So let us join together in glorifying the Lord this day. Let's turn to him 55. To God, to God be the glory. Great things he hath done. 55. Let's stand together as we sing our praise to God. deserve to be received in this way. The clothed in Christ's righteousness uh, allows us access to come boldly into the holiest place, into your presence. And we pray that you enable us and help us to do so well this day, that we would in fact glorify your name. You have done great things in creating and redeeming us. You have done great things in bringing us pardon and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Pray that you continue to do those great things. It's 
sanctifying us for your name's sake. We come and we lift up our praise and our prayer in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. Part of the hymnal is the ancient Apostles' Creed. Our corporate confession of faith today, where we can join together, uh, bring our voices together, stating what it is we believe. And not only to one another, but with uh, many countless numbers of God's people on this Lord's Day who are probably using these very words. And also those who through the entire age have used these expressions and said what it is that they believe about uh, in, in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and some of the blessings that come from that. With that in mind, let me ask you, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father. Turn 
turned me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. story's been told for a long time, including the Psalms and the ways that uh, his um, covenant love and care is provided. This story is uh, a much bigger and longer story than we, we often think of the narrow uh, and shorter, briefer uh, events that God has orchestrated, especially in Christ. Those are very important. Uh, but even as we read Psalm 47, draws the story goes way back, way back. Uh, let's see, it said 478, not 427. I better find the right one before we get started. 478, let us sing and then encourage one another in the story of Jesus and his love. You can remain really seated.
share some with you. you uh, in fact, I want to encourage you to turn to the hymn um, and to follow along. Uh, Great God, why do I see and hear? You can find it on page 321, or hymn 321, and um, follow along. It's not that we don't have confidence that we will enunciate, <laughs> but it will be helpful. There's a, yes, it's, a, it's a Martin Luther hymn. And so, obviously, the translation off, it's, it's uh, very richly packed, and we would really benefit, I think, seeing the words will, will be helpful. Let's uh, turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is humbling to consider our position through you that you are the great judge. One day we will face that, that final judgment. And how beautiful it is to consider that you have provided for us that we, though guilty and deserving your condemnation, will be commended and counted as righteous and judged righteous, not because
because of our own efforts, but because of the righteousness of Christ that is granted to us, credit to our account. Help us to not only appreciate that truth, that truth of our justification by faith, and by grace through faith, but also let it influence our daily commitment to you. Help us by the working of your spirit to live out in the conduct of our lives the righteousness that has been counted for us. That we in fact would in reality show your holiness in our lives just as you are. We're here today because we know we continually need you to shape us and to mold us after the image of Christ and we more and more need your help to overcome that sinful impulse that continues to be with us. Though we are made new and we have a new ruler in our lives, Christ himself, we still can easily be influenced by that sinful nature. So we ask for your help. We ask for your care and your guidance and your wisdom at work in our hearts that you would be sanctifying us day by day. Help us to know and to love, to devote ourselves to your word, which is truth, and apply it to our lives, that we would not sin against you, and we would, in fact, fulfill that word and all that it teaches us, that we may be agents of your grace, ambassadors of Christ, reflecting your glory, whatever we do. One of those ways is to intercede for our brothers and sisters. We can pray that you hear our prayers. Help us to be faithful in lifting up the burdens and the concerns of our brothers and sisters in Christ, not only in, in this particular church, but wherever they are. Give us interest and concern.
pray for the, uh, our young people, the young adults, really. We have a long list of those. Some, uh, some are married, and some are about to be married. And we pray that you care for them, that you direct them. We're grateful um, having Eric and Tiffany right here with us today. We pray for their marriage. We pray not only for them as a young married couple, but for, um, for all of us who are married. We know that that is one of the beautiful places that the gospel the ushers now to come forward as we worship to the bringing of our tithes and offerings and you'll notice that to the offer over here there's 88 it's actually the same tune it'll be different words obviously but the same tune is my hope is built on that anyway so I'll sing the first verse of 88 
Athens. But for now, we see after leaving Philippi uh, and moving on, he uh, they continue on a trip of probably about 100 miles. Okay, so we're not looking at just moving down to the next uh, community or the next uh, town or village. Uh, they uh, move on. It says as it begins that they go through Amphipolis and Apollonia. Uh, it, does that mean they did no ministry whatsoever? They proclaimed, I, I don't know. We're just told they moved through there. And it seems like the primary concern was to go to these most prominent cities and first start in particular places like the synagogues and, and make known uh, the gospel and especially the identity, the purpose and, and of who Jesus Christ was, especially fulfilling what the Old Testament anticipated. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't talk to people along the way, but Luke, as moved by the Holy Spirit to write this down, didn't tell us anything about it. Just as they traveled through there, again, to cover 100 miles in those days would have taken a while. And so, and now you can jump in, you know, jump, jump in your car and be there in less than two hours, but and that's not the case in Paul and Silas' uh, situation. They had to travel on foot and, and perhaps other ways, but uh, it would have taken a while. Probably along the way, they worshiped and they prayed. You know, even when they were in prison last week, we saw they would sing and they would pray. And the other prisoners knew about it. So they must have been doing it out loud. They must have been doing it in a way so others would know. I, I would think that's probably an enduring quality of their Christian witness. But what Luke, what God wants us to know specifically is to see about their particular ministry. Um, as they get into the cities and they go to the synagogues. We're really going to break this down into two things. Uh, notice in Thessalonica, I've started to call this us uh, reactions to the gospel, jealousy, and interest. Uh, yeah. First, we'll see, let's see what happens in Thessalonica. Uh, and that's the jealousy part. Now, of course, here I'm focusing on the ones who didn't believe and who resisted. Um, but the jealousy resulted from what? I mean, even with the jealousy, the other side of the coin. Was that it's because there was belief. There were many of the Jews. Uh, there were many of the Greeks in the area, the God fearers, uh, the Greeks who would come to synagogue and pray uh, to the true and living God. And of course, Luke, in both cases, both situations, you'll notice he specified women. Um, probably due to the fact that um, he, he does. He specifies in his gospel. He will give more names of particular women women who are around. He seems to emphasize that more. It's one of the ways in which he tends to encourage and, um, and make known that this gospel is there to impact those who are somewhat marginalized. Uh, and women in those days would have had much uh, less, uh, you know, the, the rights and the privileges would have been much less. And yet Luke, God, for Luke, wants to make sure we know that, that's, uh, that, that the women, that their belief in the following Christ was very important. So in Thessalonica, that's where they start. Uh, let's look at this. this. There's actually a double response, which probably sounds like the same sermons we've uh, given in all the other cities we go. There usually was that double response. Uh, Berea might be the one, uh, might be an incredible exception in that the ones there tended to be very interested and fall through. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the problem came from those who left Thessalonica and come to Berea to stir up the trouble. And we've seen that happen as well already. In Thessalonica, though, we see that um, Paul and Silas begin to proclaim this gospel, and they are getting back to the task at hand. And what is that task? I would say, mostly, that task is to proclaim and to make known the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they're primarily doing. Now, in this case, there's specific ways that they mention here that Jesus Christ is, is being made known. And one is that they are showing from the scriptures. Now, they didn't pull out their Gideon New Testament, the Psalms and Proverbs, because the New Testament wasn't written yet. They, they opened up the Old Testament scriptures to make sure those in the synagogue, again, uh, I'll mention that in a second, but the, uh, to make sure they could see 
that they're not coming with some new, off the wall, arbitrary, unusual. Just we just pulled this, you know, up from uh, from nothing uh, message. They're actually showing that those scriptures that were received and believed and accepted as the very revealed truth of God in the Old Testament demonstrates that Messiah, the Christ, must come, he must suffer, he must die, and he must be resurrected. That was the way in which they were proclaiming Jesus. And in the synagogue, they were making that effort. As the same in Thessalonica says, as was his custom, notice we've seen this before, that, now remember, just a few chapters ago, we saw um, Paul had a vision his vision was a Macedonian man, a, a Greek, saying, come over, we need you, we want you to come, we want, you know. So in this vision, and then in his consulting, and in a, uh, in, and together they all agreed that they should, uh, they should go uh, to Greece, what we, what would be Greece then. And so they make that, that effort. So this is more uh, of an effort to, to reach and to interact with the Greek world, the Gentile world. However, that's not to disregard and ignore the fact that God's covenant dealing in the past was with the descendants of Abraham, the Jews, Israel, and that there's certainly a tremendous foundation already there. So they continue when they come to a promised city and a synagogue is established. Said that way because remember in Philippi they, were, they met with the group who was praying down by the riverside. There wasn't a synagogue, probably they needed at least ten men to have a synagogue, an official synagogue. They met. It almost seemed like it wasn't exclusively women, but it was predominantly women who were gathering for prayer in Philippi. But in Thessalonica, there's a synagogue. His custom was to go to the synagogue. There would be uh, already a foundation in that. Those who gather uh, receive the Old Testament as authoritative and, and revealed from God uh, to make him, him known to them, to know of his covenant dealings with them. And that would give him a foundation to build upon to show them just what it says here. What does it say? As was the custom, verse 2, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days. It appears to be that this uh, riot this mob uh, action did not take place on after the third, the third Sabbath that he was there. It's hard for me to imagine that they could peacefully come back a couple of times. And, you know, I'll start on the first one. They, for two, for two Sabbaths, he did some things, said some things, and maybe on the third, it culminated in driving it home very forcefully that Jesus Christ and what they knew, what they observed, what they witnessed in his in his life and resurrection and his appearing. Uh, they drove that home and, and then many believed and responded. Or it says some did, I guess I should say. Some. Enough that the rest of them really get worked up on. And so, um, but what are they trying to show? Explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And this being from the scripture. Reasoning this from the scripture. Okay? And then, of course, it goes on uh, that. Jesus, uh, as Jesus I am proclaiming, is the Christ. Uh, is the Christ. He is the expected anointed one. He is the expected Messiah that the Old Testament proclaimed. That's where the, that is the essence of, of Christian ministry. It was the essence of Paul and Silas' message as they went out. It is at the core. We have to make sure we keep it there at the center and at the epicenter of our ministry. And that sounds weird to say, right? That a Christian church ought to mainly be about Christ. And yet all over the place, churches are so easily pulled away. Sometimes many good things may arise. But before long you can find out that those good things replace the central thing. And then it can be lost. Not necessarily completely lost, but it can just be, it can be, uh, the, the, the target is wrong. We exist because of Christ. We're saved because we accept and receive and trust in Christ alone for our salvation. 
He is the one who has done everything to secure our salvation with God and our righteousness with Him. So we can't push Him to the side. And, and by the way, you don't push Him to the side after you come, become a Christian. He's still the center. He then, he, you know, we call the one who say, okay, accept Him as Savior, but you also accept Him as Lord. He's the Lord of your life. He continues to lead. You can see Paul Siles here emphasizing Christ in the synagogue. Building on the foundation of the scriptures that they already had. They're showing from those scriptures that he had to suffer, die, and be raised again. The resurrection. The resurrection is not easily, you know, the most, you know, easily and prominently found in the Old Testament, but it's there. And if you remember, even those believers on the road of Emmaus in Luke's gospel, when Jesus walked among them, he demonstrated that he must suffer and die and be raised again. From the scriptures, the Old Testament. Um, one could say that even Psalm 27, we read a minute ago, where yes, we're reading it as if believers can read those of it, but it also, at least one of them, one of those verses suggests that this was a psalm that reflected the experience of Jesus, his being his being harassed, and, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and ridiculed. Yet his confidence was still God. Jesus fulfilled Psalm 27 in his experience, like none of us ever will. And yet his hope was that he would see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. He died and suffered, and then he was raised to life, and he's ascended to heaven in glory in a way that uh, in, in a way that's unique to his role and position. Uh, that would be play, but that's that's you know you have to see that. Or another place where, like um, Jesus brought up among uh, the, the scribes and Pharisees, and, 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 you know, didn't, didn't you see where David said that, his, that um, he was not a bad man to be raised and was not seen dead? Well, we know exactly where David is buried. He died and his body was still in the grave. Well, who was he talking about? Well, he was looking forward to another who would come, who would not be a bad man to be raised, who would not suffer continuously. Death. Who is that? Well, that's Jesus. Um, also, you might even look back. Isaiah 52, the end of 52 and 53, we often read when we, we talk about the sufferings of Christ, but there is one verse there as you get to the end, talking about him suffering, being stricken and smitten for our transgressions, but then there's a one verse that says he'll be restored to the light or the light of light. Uh, sometimes it's spelled out that way in English there. Resurrection is there in the Old Testament. Not as direct and prominent in the way we see it in the Gospels and how it's proclaimed in the epistles, but it's there. And Paul, his ministry was about that. They had proving from the scriptures. Jesus suffered, died, and was raised. Now, notice this jealousy. Upset because some follow him. Jason included, and Jason are the, the director, the leader of the synagogue, uh, and others. Uh, they get this mob together, but notice what they say. Their charge is not about, um, as in other places, they they were brought forward. The charge is not about them uh, proclaiming an illegitimate religion, because right? the Romans had a lot of flexibility among the religion. The Jewish religion was a was a, a, a legitimate, okay, an accepted religion. Christianity kind of lived on the because it had you know, grown out of that, they accepted it. They didn't make that case. What did they make the case? What was their case against them? These men who caused trouble all over the world there in verse 6 are now here making trouble. And Jason Jason uh, has accepted the man and this sort of thing. What are they saying? They didn't say, oh, they're just a little bit older. Oh, they're claiming there's another king besides Caesar. Often this was a tactic because uh, there was nothing that would stir up the, the Romans more than to think somebody was challenging the authority and the power of Caesar. And so they claim they're, 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 they're causing trouble here. They're, they're disturbing the peace that the Romans give to us. They're causing this disturbance. 
completely disregarded. And by the way, notice this. This is a tactic that Satan has influenced going back to the beginning. They're saying something true, right? There is a king other than Caesar. There's a king other than Caesar. But they're completely distorting and perverting what they believe about that. Don't be surprised, Christian. When people take the very things that are sacred and beautiful about the word of God and the truth of the gospel, and they take that and they twist it around a little bit to use it against us and to re reflect it in a, in a very poor light, you know, on They did believe the truth. They, they, they were saying something that was very true. It's not me, is it? I don't think so. Okay, good. Uh, I thought I'd double check before I come up here. Uh, the, uh, anyway, they, they stated the truth. Remember, remember, remember? This is the tactic. Did, did he really say? Did he really say not to eat of that? I think God really just. He doesn't want you to know good and evil like he does. Did he really say? You know, the question is distort what is said the truth. Satan will use and influence people to use the truths to really mess them up in order to re reflect uh, a God and a Christ and a lesson. Don't be surprised when that happens. Do you know why God's big enough to handle that? And he's big enough to sustain us in the midst of that, just as he did Paul's times. In this case, we don't see them getting uh, arrested and suffering as a result. We actually see them delivered. Now, we saw in Philippi that they weren't always delivered. And on that occasion, they were arrested, but they were put in the stocks. They were delivered only, but they had to suffer for a while uh, from being incarcerated. But in this case, they, they get away and they're sent off to Korea. So, the gospel's proclaimed, there's belief, and then there's a jealous resistance that distorts God's truth. It, it's like they, it's sort of like in Romans 1. They deny God's truth, but in some ways they take that which that is true, that God is real, and sort of do something to make it uh, something else. I think it's one of the reasons why we have to be, you know, sly as serpents, innocent as doves, when we begin to speak about the word and the gospel in public, right before people, they don't, they don't have a foundation, they don't have an understanding. I've, people have told me, say, listen, be careful because anything that can be misunderstood will be misunderstood, and it can be used against you in any way that you, you cannot predict. That's exactly the truth. That, that's the way it happens. We do have to be kind of careful and prudent in that. And seek the Lord's help in making this truth known and to preserve it even among those attacks and, and the perversions that will happen. Now in Berea, there's a simple thing. There's a, a jealous opposition that Berea is the best example of a proper, humble response that people ought to have to the proclamation of the gospel. And the Lord God. It must have been a relief for Paul and Silas to finally come to a group of people and say some things, telling them about Jesus in the Old Testament, and they said, you know what? Hey, let's sit down and study that. Uh, I remember uh, being in graduate school, I did some uh, basketball officiating there. Don't get in the basketball, stick with baseball. At least you have a mask on. Um, the the uh, I remember going, uh, there was a church called the Berean Bible Church. I think that school is built up there or came out of that. But they, okay, they hired officials to come, not because they needed to, because it was a wonderful, a wonderful, they really exemplified the name of Berean. Uh, it was a wonderful relief from all the other church leagues I had officiated in. You know, they didn't need officials, but they had them anyway. They simply wanted somebody there to kind of blow the whistle and this and that happened. And it was like a big fellowship event. The men and the boys were out there playing basketball. Women and children over here, they're just hanging out, having a great time in this gym. And I thought, 
there's no need for officials here. These people love each other and they just enjoy being here. It's a marvelous Christian testimony of how it ought to be when you want to get together and do something that promotes health and, and Christian fellowship. They exemplify that. I always like that. I mean, if you ever see a church named Berean? I, boy, they picked a name. That they better they better be examining themselves to, to see if they're reflecting what they said here. The Bereans, it says, were a more noble character. And the way that is specified is, is that they received the message with eagerness and examined the scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now you notice they didn't say, oh, they received it and just believed it without any concern whatsoever. No, they heard it. He said, we need to look into this more. And they studied diligently. They believed the scriptures enough that they said, we got to sit down and study this deeply. It says, many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and Greek men. Why does it say that? Well, again, the synagogue was especially filled with people of the Jewish heritage, but many Greeks come to appreciate this, this Hebrew religion, this Jewish religion. And they would gather with them. Now, if they were uh, proselytes, they would have gone all the way and then would receive the covenant sign of circumcision. But they were God fearers, they were, uh, they were called. They worshiped with them in the synagogue. As, you know, and I, I don't think that was to assume they were less than believers, but they, they were there. They were just distinguished in terms of their, their background. Would we be that kind of people? Like the Bereans? who diligently and earnestly want to just continue to seek the scriptures to see what God has for us? I would hope so. There's a time, especially for Presbyterians in particular, were known as the people of the book. Why? Because they just, they just, they, they wanted to earnestly study the Bible and know it in its depth, in its detail, as God's word that every jot and tittle was given by him and authoritative True and trustworthy in every manner. Well, the Bereans give us that example. It must have been a relief for Paul and Silas to get somewhere. Now, it didn't last too long because they come from Thessalonica, stirring up trouble, and again they take them out. The Lord's deliverance and relief there, but before it happens, they have ample opportunity to make Christ known to the Bereans. The gospel. Lord Jesus and the proclamation of it is going out and it's having its effect. Yes, there's a jealous opposition, but there's also a godly, honest, noble interest. We have to stand firm against that jealous opposition, being wise as serpents, innocent as doves, proclaiming it, and we must take full advantage of being careful to teach this word and this gospel carefully those whose interest is deep and they want to earnestly dig in like the Bereans. May God grant us all the grace and wisdom necessary to do that well in this place and wherever we gather with Christians uh, to study and worship. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, we do this because we're leaning, leaning on the Lord. He's the one making it happen. So how about we do 616 is our final round. We do a watch and one more thing. How about we do the uh, first and last verse? 616, we'll stand together by a hand of response.